Uh, so my friend Brian, um, on Sunday morning, they have between 150 to 200 people gathered. Um, out of those 200, about 120 of them to 150 of them are pastors. Um, throughout the rest of the week, um, these 150 pastors lead micro churches based around passion and mission. Some with the gather uh, 15 prostitutes in the what would be like the red light district. Uh, uh, others uh, have a, a bicycle shop that a bicycling club comes and the word is taught and prayers are prayed and disciples are being made. Others uh, uh, get with the homeless and have a gathering of 30 homeless in, in, a, in a park area and are raising up disciples. They sing and they worship with gusto and the pastor pastors that micro church and throughout Tampa in a week there will be five 5,000 people that call the underground their church and yet on Sunday mornings they'll have between 150 and 200 in attendance. How large of church does Brian Sanders pastor? What's the size of his church? Is it 150 to 200 or is it 5,000 people who are in these micro churches that are being led by these lay people who are being raised up to pastor and make disciples? Now the same thing is happening in Belfast. He's taken Tampa underground there and Kansas City underground is springing up. And you, a lot of people now in the underground don't hardly know who Brian Sanders is, but there's this multiplication that's happening. Some groups are 12 people and some groups are 120 people. But the gospel is going forth and changing lives in mighty and powerful ways because Brian understands the multiplication mindset. So let me run through, and Brian, uh, Brian launched this, Brian Warth launched us into some of this thinking, but uh, first of all, I'll talk about the theology of multiplication. Um, in, in a book that I wrote called Playthuno, which is the Greek word for multiply, I, I lay out an entire theology of multiplication. That's on exponential.org. But let me just say this quickly about the theology of multiplication. As Brian says, multiplication is God's operating system from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. In fact, even before uh, Adam and Eve are created, you look at, uh, you look at what the uh, creation uh, account emphasizes, and it emphasizes the seed. You, you read the first few verses of, of your Bible, it emphasizes the seed, and the seed is that which is capable and, and, cre and has that potential of being multiplied. Even more than the fruit, it's the seed that's, that's given the attention. We focus on the fruit, but God focuses on the seeds. And then the first commandment is be fruitful and multiply. It repeated to Noah. It's repeated to Israel, to Abraham, to Israel in Egypt. Uh, to e Israel, once they move into the promised land, they go into captivity in Babylon. And you can find all these references in Babylon. God says multiply there. They get out of Babylon, post-Babylon. He says, hey, now multiply. And then you get to Jesus. You come to Jesus. And what was the ministry method of Jesus? It wasn't an addition model. He, he didn't go to Jerusalem, set up in the public courts of the temple and see how many people he could get. He didn't send out people to say, hey, go get them and bring them back to me. That was not his method of ministry. No, not at all. What did he do? He chose 12. And he said, to follow me and I'll send you out. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you out two by two in the villages and they're going to preach. And so Jesus began to multiply himself, multiply ministry. That was his way of spreading the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus knew that 12 disciples that multiplied were bigger than the biggest crowd you could ever get in the temple courts of Jerusalem. The theology of multiplication. And then, then you get from uh, Jesus' ministry, you, you get to uh, the New Testament church. And there again, as the church launches, you see this pattern of multiplication. 
In fact, the first time that the New Testament church has really summarized a, a, a summary statement about how the church is advancing is in Acts 9.31. And it says, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. Now, some of your versions, some of your translations will have increased, but that's not really the right translation there. The word can mean increased, but based on context. And you look at the context of what was happening in the New Testament church, and you don't see addition you see multiplication. You see churches that are planting churches that are planting churches, and it's being spread. That's multiplication. Well, let's, there's much more that could be said on the theology of multiplication, but let's move to the historicity. The historicity of multiplication. What I mean by that is when you look back, where do you see multiplication? Let me go back to the first century church. I want to suggest to you that the first century church had its Pauls and it had its Peters and that's who we tend to focus on. But if you go to Romans chapter 16 and you begin to look at all the ordinary names that are listed there, these ordinary names that are listed there that are most of them that are only found there in Romans 16. These are the people that are multiplying the church. Ordinary people, not the Pauls, not the Peters, not the Johns. These are the ones on the ground, group by group, spreading the multiplication message of the gospel. Ordinary folks like Stephen, like Philip, like Priscilla, like Aquila, like Junia. That they are multiplying the gospel group by group. Then you come to the great uh, movement of John Wesley and then the Methodist movement in America. It expanded in America. And one of the main ways that it did uh, uh, in, in its earlier days was through circuit riders. Now, this, this is really amazing. A number of men became traveling ministers in the late 18th and early 19th century. And in that area, the era, the... Methodist denomination did not establish social or educational qualifications for ordination. Church leaders, and I'm quoting now from a historic book, uh, church leaders accepted every sincere person as a candidate for ministry. Itinerants from 16 to over 60 years of age traveled horseback on American circuits, and he says that most preachers were quote-unquote plain folk. Members of the toiling classes. And what happened? The church multiplied. Methodist churches sprang up through communities throughout this nation. William Watters, um, he was the first Native American Methodist itinerant preacher. He was not formally trained for ministry, yet he wrote this. Listen to what he wrote. The word of the Lord would be as fire in my bones... And I dare not refrain from declaring his loving kindness to my fellow sinners. Does that fire burn in your bones? We can teach you about hero making and grit in the midst of the fire. But if you don't have fire in your bones, don't expect multiplication to happen. Because it's not a program. It's the Spirit of God. Setting your heart on fire for those who don't know him. And you've probably heard me say this. Now, then the free Methodist movement, how did it advance so rapidly? Well, David McKenna tells us that it expanded through the Pentecostal bands in his book, A Future, with a history on the free Methodist movement. At the General Conference in 1890, the delegates voted to regulate, thwart, and stop Pentecostal bands, which were primarily lay people. Did you hear me? Lay people. Who, who was spreading the church? Who was multiple? Lay people, Pentecostal bands. They, they voted to thwart and stop them that were evangelizing and rapidly multiplying free Methodist churches. McKenna goes on to say, the delegates and leaders wanted control rather than obedience to Christ. McKenna says that, I quote, that the fires of aggressive evangelism that characterized free Methodism during the first 30 years of its history were banked, if not snuffed out. What has brought 
the kingdom of God forward, the gospel forward, what has advanced the church of Jesus Christ is multiplication through ordinary people who get filled with the Holy Spirit and have a heart for the loss. It's gospel urgency. That's what has done it. In fact, early Americans, I love this. I, I didn't know this and until I was doing some research for this talk, early Americans would describe the severity of a storm. Think back at early 1800s. They would describe the severity of a storm this way. This is, if it was really a severe storm, here's what they say. There's no one out today except crows and Methodist preachers. we looking for comfort or have we sold out for the cause of Jesus Christ where the severity of the storm in our church or in our neighborhoods will not stop us the obscurity of multiplication is my next blank the obscurity of multiplication let me tell you very quickly that uh, addition is quicker at first and it gains more notoriety Addition is quicker at first than multiplication. And even over the long term, addition in our current culture will gain you more notoriety than multiplication. I just want to be upfront about that. This is what John was talking about in changing the scorecard. Changing the scorecard for your personal leadership, but also changing the scorecard of your church. But multiplication exponentially surpasses addition over the long term, yet usually brings little attention to the initiator, even so much so that, like my friend Brian, some people don't even know Brian, uh, uh, and yet he kind of helped, he initiated the underground. Just, just one quick example of the, dish, uh, of the difference. There, you could give a lot of examples of the difference between addition and uh, a multiplication. Imagine you have a checkerboard. Anybody know how many squares on a checkerboard? 64. Uh, I wouldn't win a Jeopardy. I looked it up. I didn't know. But uh, 64. So let's imagine you've got 64 squares and, and you want to start adding souls to the kingdom of the checkerboard, the Jesus checkerboard, okay? And so you've got one on square one. On square two, you uh, double that and you've got two. On square three, you double that and now, um, well, wait, 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 I messed up. Let's start with addition. If you stack one checker on square one, and then two on square two, and then three on square three, and then four on square four, and then five on square five, and then six on square six, you, you're with me. So you and you go all the way to sixty-four. You know how many? You know, and you just keep stacking up higher and higher. By the time you're at the sixty-four square. All of the numbers on the checkerboard, if you were to add up every checker on your checkerboard with 64 on that last one and just right on down, do you know how many checkers you would have on your checkerboard? A big number. 2,080 checkers. But if you went back to square one and you put a checker there and the square two, you doubled that. And you had two, and square three, you doubled that, and you had four. And the next one, square, you had eight. And the next one, you had 16. And the next one, you had 32. And the next one, you had 64. By the time you got to square 32, do you know how many checkers would be on your board? Over 21 billion checkers would be on just half of the checkerboard. This is the difference between addition and multiplication. And for the last 40 years, the, the church has majored in addition, and it's good. And you cannot stop addition. We, we need to thank God for every person that comes in into our church. I'm the one screaming the loudest when John says they had over 6,000 for Easter. Yeah, I'm Mr. Multiplication Man, but I'm screaming for that because that's over 600, almost 700 people came to faith in Jesus Christ. That is awesome. That's addition. 
You know what that gives you? Potential for multiplication. So we need addition and multiplication. But we have to focus on multiplication because our egos will always pull you towards addition because there's obscurity often or almost always in multiplication. I often ask rooms of pastors, I'll ask you, you may have been there when I've asked this before, but um, how many of you have heard of Joel Osteen? Joel Osteen, yeah, raise your hand if you've heard of Joel Osteen, okay. If you haven't, uh, we're going to pray for your cultural uh, <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> um, got one of the biggest, if not the biggest, just one place churches in America. The bastion, the, 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 the picture, the poster child of addition. How many of you have heard of Ralph Moore? Ralph Moore. One, two, I know you're his friend, but... Uh, Ralph Moore. See, two people? They say, well, who is Ralph Moore? Well, can I tell you that Ralph Moore started a church called Hope Chapel in Hermosa about, 40, about 42 years ago. And then he went to Hawaii. And, uh, well, from that church, he already planted a church. He went to Hawaii, and they, they started planting more. And then those churches started planting more. Uh, last month, seven more were planted. Um, and now over 2,500 churches, over 250,000, a quarter million people go to churches that were planted by Hope Chapel or planted by a church that was planted by Hope Chapel. His, his kingdom impact, just in terms of size, I'm not God, but his ting, kingdom impact is 5 to 10 to 100 times larger than Joel Osteen. And none of you have heard of Ralph Moore. He and I share hotel rooms when we speak at conferences. Here's a guy that is a hero of the faith. Having to sleep in the same hotel room as a Kansas farm boy. I mean, poor guy. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying. Uh, I am thankful. You know, I, I was... I told you how our culture has rewarded and celebrated addition, and that has been so much the focus, and I'm thankful for so much of the church growth thinking. We need to learn from it. Some of it we need to throw away, but we need to learn from it and grow our churches. We do. And Outreach Magazine, which is the second largest uh, circulating Christian magazine in America, has been for the last 25 or 30 years the publisher of the fastest growing churches. Who are the fastest growing churches in America? And who are the 100 biggest churches in America? And it was like porn for pastors. Like, whoa, look at that. Look at that. I got to get on that list. You know, it was like the scoreboard for American pastors is to be on that list. I, Outreach Magazine, um, I have an article in Outreach Magazine this month, uh, and it's about some of the things I'm teaching uh, today, but uh, just uh, two weeks ago they came to us at Exponential, maybe it's been four weeks ago now, um, and said, we want, to, we want to do something different, instead, we, we, instead of just doing our usual, we'll keep doing that, we want to have an issue focused on the 100 multiplying churches in America. Will you help us find those? So that's coming up. And it, it just signals what the Holy Spirit is doing in America and what must be done in America if we hope to start winning instead of losing our share of disciples that need to be made. Amen? And then you have the resiliency of multiplication um, the resiliency of multiplication. What do I mean by that? We need to really consider our model of church if our model is limiting the expansion of the church. And let me say it again. We need all forms of churches, all sizes. I often talk about it this way. Um, we need Ikeas with their 300,000 square feet. I don't know how, much, how many square feet you have. You just added some more, right? And uh, I, love, I love that. And there's about 54 Ikeas in America. We need Ikea churches. We really do. That church is changing that whole area. 
Uh, we need Dollar General. Everybody knows what a Dollar General store is. They're about 8,000 square feet. And uh, they would equate maybe to the, the church of, uh, of 200, uh, 100 to 200 to 300. Um, and Dollar General stores have about 8,000 square feet. And there's about 13,000 of them in, uh, in the U.S. And then we need Starbucks churches. Come on, Starbucks. I'm a Starbucks fan. The average Starbucks is, is, is 1,500 square feet, uh, and there's 24,000 of them. We need all forms of church, but we need to ask ourselves this question. Is our form of church restricting the expansion of the church in our ministry area? Let, let me go further. When taxes or laws or zoning or expenses or cultural pressures or educational requirements, and the list could go on, can constrict the spread of the church, then we have got to reassess the model of how we're doing church. So let me give you an example from where I live. Long Beach. Half a million people in Long Beach. I've been ministering there for 28 years. Do you know how many new Protestant evangelical church buildings have been built in 28 years? Zero. In a city of half a million. None. Do you know how many warehouses or other buildings that they've issued CUPs, conditional use permits, so that it, it, its use can be translated into a church. Um, I don't know, Brian, how many you think? Are, are there any? I can't think of one. Brian's been there a long time. I can't think of one in 25 years. Do you know what that means? It means if we want to expand the church, but they're not allowing it in zoning, yeah, we could fight it constitutionally if you got the money and the time. If that's restricting, so, so you say, well, well, yeah, but aren't there a lot of empty churches? Well, there's 300 church buildings approximately in Long Beach that are evangelical gospel preaching churches. And the average seating in them is about 150 seats. The average seating, maybe 100, uh, between 150, let's call it 100. If you filled all of them one time on a Sunday, that's 30,000 people. If you filled them, you go to two services, or you go to 20 services like Brian, maybe you could do it. But, uh, uh, but if you filled them twice, 300 churches filled twice on a Sunday, and you're at 60,000, and you're going to tell the other 450,000 people go to hell. We don't have room, because we want to do church this way, in this form, that's church. So we, we, just, we just have to, uh, we have to refuse to let our model of church restrict the gospel. What, what are we going to do if, when they take away housing allowance from pastors or they take away the charitable deduction from our income taxes and, 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 and church income drops by 40% in your church? How is that going to change the shaping of what you do and how you do ministry? Um, Multiplication churches can, their forms can adapt to whatever that current reality is because their effectiveness is not based on how many people they can get together in one place because it's not for them uh, about gathering and how many you can get there but how many you can send from there. That's the difference in multiplication. Then that leads to the, the inclusivity of multiplication, the I there is inclusivity of multiplication. And what I mean by that is, in addition, only a few get to play the really big game. The megachurch model is, very, uh, is a very non-inclusive group. Not because, um, not because the pastors who are there don't want anybody else there. They want them there. They want to invite people. They want to help churches grow. Just like John, he does all he can to equip us to help grow our churches. We need to listen to him more. But the, 
but the reality is that once your church gets past 200 people, you as a pastor either need to have the gift of leadership or really empower somebody on your team that has the gift of leadership because you begin to manage more and more things that make it more and more difficult to continue to grow that church. And there's very rare air when, when you consider that 94% of churches in America are 200 and under. And, and pastors beat themselves up because I, I can't get my church over 200. And they, they're like, I'm a loser pastor. I can't get my church past 50. I'm a loser pastor. And if your scorecard is addition and how big you are, yeah, you're not winning the game. But it has to ask, are you playing the right game? That's why I named my book Playthuno because uh, when I heard that Greek word for multiplication, Playthuno, I thought the guy on the translation, you know, I, I don't know Greek very well, so I pushed the button and he says, Playthuno, Playthuno. I thought he said Play Uno. I like, I played Uno last night. <laughs> but it was Playthuno. And the game that God really wants us to play, regardless of the size of your church, is multiplication, hero making, be, beginning to raise up people and send them out and think kingdom instead of just how many people are there on Sunday morning. Um, here, here's what I was really encouraged by. <laughs> Ralph Moore, we had him, um, we had him share at Exponential just a few uh, a couple months ago in Orlando, we had 5,000, oh, oh, almost 6,000 pastors gathered from all over the world and all over the United States to learn about multiplication. And um, my role is the National Director of Equipping and Spiritual Engagement. So Ralph, not this time, but a previous time, was up there, and I, I didn't know Ralph yet. They were interviewing him. And he talked about, uh, you know, Ralph has just turned 73. And at this time, he would, he'd just turned 70. And uh, he said, if, um, if the Lord gives me another 20 years, I really think I can reach a million people. Now, 70 years old, I'm thinking about retirement. <laughs> And he's thinking about reaching a million people. Now, how can Ralph, who just retired last year from his church, reach a million people? Because if he makes a disciple who the next year, the two of them make two disciples. And the next year, the four of them make each make a disciple. And they make eight disciples. And then those eight disciples the next year make 16 disciples and that pattern continues, it's very possible for him to make a million disciples before he dies if God gives him 20 more years. I know the math never works that way and people criticize that kind of thinking because, well, it doesn't really work that way. But here's my question. If over the next 20 years... You just, took one, you just took three people for three years. I mean, Jesus took 12 for three years, and look what happened. But if you took three people for three years, and you did that for 20 years, guess what? You would have made over 2,000 disciples. And what's the definition of a megachurch in America? 2,000 and above. I'm here to tell you that every ordinary believer in your church, almost every ordinary believer in your church, has a mega church inside of them. Every ordinary believer that has an urgency for the gospel and has the Holy Spirit within them and has a multiplication mindset that would disciple three people for three years and with the definition that I'm going to give in a minute for disciple making, if they would do that within 20 years, over 2,000 people would have been discipled. That would be their kingdom legacy, their kingdom imprint. Every ordinary believer has a mega church inside of them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And meanwhile, 
pastors are feeling like losers because they can't get enough people there on Sunday morning. And they think, well, if I just work harder at this, maybe I can get a few more there. How about we just invest a little more in some people that will go and make disciples? Um, let me tell you about your personal multiplication capacity. Um, I, I give you a little chart there, and um, here's what I've discovered. I was teaching at Saddleback last week, and about 250 pastors were in, and I, I taught this for the first time. I don't have time to teach them. It was like an hour-long teaching, but I just wanted to give you the nub of it. Um, empowered times, empowering If you multiply your empowered times your empowering, that gives you your personal multiplication capacity. Let me explain. You've got to understand the terms. Empowered means that you gain power. You're being filled with the Holy Spirit. You're gaining God's heart. You're asking daily, you're fasting, you're praying, you're in the Word not to conquer a certain number of chapters, but to really feed upon the Word of God. And you are empowered by the Spirit. And you get up like, Holy Spirit, you're going to use me today. That's that's the empowered. And and on a scale of 1 to 10, that fluctuates all the time, doesn't it, in you? And the Holy Spirit doesn't leave you. But how empowered you are fluctuates by how surrendered you are and how you're engaging with the Holy Spirit. That's the empowered axis. The Y axis. The x-axis is whether you are empowering others. And here's the deal. You can grow a big church with a gifted number that's high on the empowered. Your charisma and spiritual gifts and you can build a really big church. But that's not the same as your personal multiplication capacity. And power and the bigger your church gives, the, gets, the more power you have. And and power that is not blended with empowering becomes corruptive power and begins to deceive you and corrupt you. And you get, and and I'm not here to pass judgment, so I'll raise it as a question. I I wonder if this is what happens, if you know these names, with, with a Hybels and a Noble and a James McDonald. And the list could go on, who were these power brokers, but they didn't have a personal multiplication capacity scale empowering is where you give away power you give away power you don't want your name to be known you want the name of Jesus to be known and you continue to empower others and it may affect the size of your church because you're just giving away so many people but you really don't care because it's about him and not about you 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 see this scale together several times I gave you some references I won't take time to go into that but um Maybe just to mention them. I love this. Um, Jesus in John uh, 20, 21 and 22. Remember, remember what happened? This is a post-resurrection appearance. He, he, he comes to the disciples and, and uh, he says, peace be with you. And then what does he say? As the Father has sent me. That's empowered. The Father sent me. I'm empowered. So I am sending you. That's empowering. And then what did he do? Breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. Empowering. You, you go to the Great Commission. What, how does that start? We often skip the start. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. That's empowered. Now you go and make disciples. That's empowering. You go over to Paul's writing in Ephesians 4. And what do we see in Ephesians 4? Hey, Christ ascended and he gave great gifts to us. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You're empowered to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's empowering. So your personal multiplication capacity is is this blend, this multiplication between empowered and empowering. So, um, the mobilization flywheel. This is a, this is a model. If you, um, it's probably on the other side of your sheet. The, the mobilization flywheel. This is a book about creating a culture of biblical mobilization. And what we did is we've, we've looked at a lot of the kingdom gospel movements that are happening around 
around the world, especially in the global south. And uh, there's different ways that those are growing, but one of the key or primary ways is, is really something similar to what to we describe in this book. But more importantly, we look at how the New Testament church um, majored in mobilizing, and we tried to capture that. And be before I get there, I guess I skipped one thing, and I want to go back to it just so I don't skip it. I'm sorry about that. The multiplication of true disciple making, the DM squared. Forgive me, I'm going back there just for a second because this is so important. Uh, I told you I'd give you my definition of a disciple, and um, it's not really my, de de my entire definition of a disciple, but it's one of the important th things. You see, for so long we've described a disciple, we've defined a disciple as someone who knows enough, that's content. They know enough of the Bible. I'm discipling you, so you've got to learn these principles, you've got to lead, learn these Bible verses, that's content and that's really good. And then we said, okay, now, you need to be nicer to your wife, you need to stop telling lies, you need to stop getting drunk every Saturday night. And we begin to work on their character, and that's discipleship, and it certainly is. And then we said, hey, you need to be doing something nice for your neighbors. You need to be on mission. You need to be serving the poor and helping. And, and that's really important in disciple making. But we left off the fourth C that is so important, and that is contagious. In other words, making a disciple who will make another disciple. Because as Dawson Trotman said, the founder of Navigator is one of the greatest disciple-making organizations ever. As he said, he said, you haven't made a disciple until your disciple makes a disciple. You know what that does? It puts the emphasis on the right salala bowl. It's that, uh, organic things are known as to be mature when they can reproduce. We make disciples that are mules instead of rabbits. If you don't know, mules can't reproduce. But God said, I want you to raise up disciples who are rabbits. Who will reproduce. Now, on to the mobilization flywheel. So, if you, if you don't know what a flywheel is, it's um, Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, which is a secular book, he, he makes this flywheel concept very popular that it's, a flywheel is hard to get going at first. It's really hard. It's, it's, a, it's a wheel and like an engine that it begins to spin slowly, but the more it spins, the more energy it begins to emit it begins to give off energy and pretty soon its own momentum is carrying and it's going faster and faster and faster and faster and this is the place the church in america is at uh, it, it's it needs this multiplication mobilization flywheel to begin to spin and it will be slow at first but the more it spins the more it's going to create kingdom energy and kingdom fruit and so that's the idea of a flywheel so in this model of the flywheel it starts with a certain kind of church. All of you here are part of a church. Different sizes, different emphasis, but you're part of a church. The mobilization flywheel says that we're going to be a church who equips and sends our people as everyday missionaries. Now, I've been a pastor at Light and Life for 28 years, and there hasn't been a week that I haven't used the word volunteer. We need more volunteers. We need volunteers for the nurse. Oh, we need volunteers for us. Oh, we need volunteers. And I have given so much energy to trying to recruit and raise up and train volunteers to run the program of my Sunday morning church. And we need those. And I'm not going to start, I'm not going to stop talking about volunteers. But you know what I haven't talked about every week? Is everyday missionaries. I haven't equipped them to say, oh, you hang out with the soccer moms every Saturday morning. You may be called there. Are you experiencing a calling there? How can I equip you? And how can I, John was talking about that, how can I lay hands on you and commission you to be a pastor to the soccer moms on, sat, uh, on, on Saturday morning? Um, it's a certain kind of church. Where we see our people, 1 Peter 2, 9, a royal priesthood. We see them more as priests instead of as volunteers. One of the phrases that I use in my teaching is this. Uh, in our churches, we train 
our people to pass out bulletins, but Jesus trained his people to cast out demons. <laughs> then we wonder why we can't get volunteers. We're not handing them the priestly work and say, go tear down a stronghold somewhere. Go prayer walk a block and start to take over a neighborhood for Jesus Christ. Lay hands on somebody. Ask that waiter if you can pray for him. Get to know that person that serves you coffee at Starbucks. Really get to know them and then pretty soon invite them over to your house. This is a church that, that really believes in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 that we're to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. When you read 2 Timothy 2, 2, and the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust, everybody say entrust, to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. In, in other words, Paul says, now Timothy, you're a really good teacher. I taught you really well. Now get as many people around you to hear your teaching as you possibly can, because you're really good. That's not how the verse goes. He says, now take what I've given you and entrust it to reliable people, not just to anybody, and I could go back to the circuit riders and give you some qualifications that they had. Okay, I just want you to know that. And trust it to reliable people who will then multiply that, who will pass that forward and entrust it to somebody else. And pretty soon, you have this generational multiplication that's going on because you're that kind of church. And then you need missionaries is the next part. So you got churches that send people out as missionaries. And these are people who see themselves differently. Um, mi missionaries, so your blanks at churches was who equip and send. Missionaries are who understand their identity, identity, and answer God's call to disciple making. We call these everyday people who are committed to be everyday missionaries who make disciples where they work, live, study, and play. Where they work, live, study, and play. Most of us miss the picture. Put, put your hand over your head like this, if you would, please, just for a second. Just go like this, and I'm not going to trick you, I promise. All right? You feel anything up there? Nope. Nothing up there? I want to tell you there's something up there. Okay, you can stop. Some of you really like that. <laughs> I want to tell you there's something up there. You know what happened on the day of Pentecost? The 12 apostles were in the upper room. Oh, oh no, that's wrong. They were in the upper room. But there were 120 ordinary people in the upper room. Ordinary people, not just the apostles. They were up there and they were praying that the Holy Spirit would come. And, and you, you know what happened, right? The sound of a rushing mighty wind. But then what else happened? In the middle of the room, there, there's a fire. And, you, and, and if you read this in verse 3, Acts 2, 3, the, the fire comes down in the middle of the room. And it's like the Holy Spirit fire, but it didn't stay there. You read it carefully. What did it do? It came and it broke apart and distributed itself over 120 heads. Not just over Peter's head or John's head. It was over 120 heads. The flame was on their head. The fire was on their head. And that's the fire that they took out to change the world for Jesus Christ. All 120 of them began to speak in languages that they'd never ever learned in order to evangelize and tell about the glories of God through Jesus Christ. All 120 of them. Not just the apostles. And we look at our people and uh, we're preaching on a Sunday morning. Man, they got problems. Boy, they're a challenge. Boy, they were cranky in the board meeting. You got them too. Okay, anyway. <laughs> but we fail to see the fire on their head. Who could they be empowered and inflamed by the Holy Spirit? Who could they be? What could they do? Do, do they have a, the big God that we have? Absolutely. Um, they just don't understand their identity, and part of that's our responsibility that they don't. And they need to also understand that, uh, that they are called. That when Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, 
go and make disciples, he was not just talking to the apostles, he was talking to all those that would follow Christ. And, and I get so tired of answering the question, what does God want me to do with my life, Pastor? What is God, what, what is God calling me to do? And, and I don't get tired of it. I, I have empathy. I, I don't tell them shut up or anything like that. I, I, I care about them, and I know what they're asking, but here's what I always come back and ask them just as kindly as I can. Um, who are you discipling? Like, no, I want to know, I want to know what career, whether to go, whether to marry him or her. You know, what am I calling? What's my, who are you discipling? Why? Because that is the first and the primary call for everyone who names themselves as a follower of Christ is that we are called to make disciples. This is how the kingdom advances. And there are then also, that's the primary calling, and it's like a rowboat, you two oars. It, it, disciple making is that primary calling, but then also there's that Ephesians 2.10 calling that for we are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus in order to do the works that God prepared for us long ago in advance before we were born. There are specific things that fit only you. There are, I please understand that. But you got to be making disciples in a way that fits your context, your environment, your personality, your circle of influence. Um, and then once you, um, once you start to make these disciples, you begin to gather them. You, you begin to get them together because there's something that happens when we gather together in his name for his mission. Something of the Holy Spirit is released there. Um, Jesus said that when two or three of you get together in my name, and it's true for 12 or 13 as well, or 20 or 30, when you get together in his name, so you take these disciples, first it might be two or three, or you take these five or six, and you begin to gather them together, not just to have a small group or a community group, and those are really good. But here's my problem with small groups. So many of them are not created in, a, in order to make disciples and mobilize disciples. It's just to bear my burdens. And those are good. We need that. Don't misunderstand me. That's a scripture. Bear each other's burden. Do that in small groups. But your gathering has to have a mission, a vision, a purpose, a fire in it to send your people out. We're just trying to get them in like, oh, and, and dare you say, oh, I think you need to multiply and, and, you know, and create two groups. What? You hate us, pastor? I'm leaving. Um. But you, you, you take these faith-based gatherings, new churches, which, um, did I give you the bank for the gatherings? Gatherings which are mobilization stations and think multiplication, that's where we're at right now, which are mobilization stations and think multiplication. In other words, when you get together, you're not just singing kumbaya, my lord, kumbaya. No, you're getting together to sing, how can we, well, let me go back to the word. Is that okay to use the Bible again? Thank you. I'm, I was going to be worried if you didn't give me one. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24. Now let us consider how to stimulate, motivate, encourage one another to love and good deeds. To love and to good deeds. In other words, to mobilize into mission. Let us, when we get together, let, let's talk about how, how's your calling going? How's your disciple making going? Let, let's encourage and motivate one another to love and good deeds as we're together. These are different kinds of gatherings, and there's a lot more. And then some of these gatherings, here's where it gets tricky and risky. I'm almost done. Um, but here's what we're seeing, and here's what needs to happen uh, more and more, especially in the urban centers. You know 80% of America lives in urban centers, much like the one I described, which is uh, in Long Beach, where it's getting harder and harder to have church buildings. So our forms of church are going to have to change if we want to see a revival and expansion of the church in cities. Just gonna, our forms of church are going to have to change. And this is going to be one of the ways that uh, churches are planted because these gatherings, and I've watched this happen time and time again. I have a friend named Wade Burnett. He's, uh, he's a lawyer who's, uh, who, who's practiced actually in front of the Supreme Court of America. But um, Wade, at his law firm, he began to disciple three guys. And 
and pretty soon they were meeting at lunch and pretty soon as they were making disciples themselves they they all pulled together and pretty soon they had 12 in the lunchroom and it was a pretty large law office and pretty soon they had 20 in the lunchroom and they were meeting together praying and none of these people had been churched before they were just the fruit of disciple making but now here they were gathering and Wade said um, I, I think the Lord wants to mature us into a church and they began to pray about that and sure enough they launched into a church but not only that they launched three other churches at the same time and now there were four new churches that had been formed from what Wade had been sent by a church Wade had, was going to a church that believed in mobilization and multiplication he began to be that missionary and that disciple maker where he worked the fruit of his disciple making became a gathering the gathering grew from disciples that were being made and then it matured into a new church that actually then spun off new churches the multiplication chain had started because of the mobilization that was taking place new churches which are formed from gatherings which become then their own new flywheel now not all gatherings will mature into a church but they will cr increase the momentum of the church there and you begin to get your small groups focused on mobilization of the saints you watch the power that comes into your church and that sending revolution that will happen but um, in order to do this and here's what gets a little tricky the ecclesiology that gives rise to movements is an ecclesiology that's enough but not too much I don't have time to really explain that except to say um, you can't make a gospel movement if you complicate the church you can't make a gospel movement if you reduce the church beyond its minimal irreducible core elements you won't have a gospel movement if you make it too simple, you won't have a church. Too low, you set the bar too low, what defines a church? You set it down too low, you won't have a church. You set it too high, you won't have a movement. You might have a church, but it's not going to do that much because it's just too complicated. It's got uh, too many prerequisites. I, I've been working with the leadership of the Wesleyan denomination, and um, they, um, I've been working with... Uh, their general superintendent Wayne Smith and Anita Eastlack and some of these great people and they're thinking in terms of multiplication and you know what they just did this last year they went back and rewrote their ecclesiology as a denomination they rewrote their ecclesiology in order to support multiplication the other thing I'd say is this the um, and I'm just kind of giving you the one sentence from kind of chapters in this book the atmosphere of prayer and fasting every everywhere we find gospel movements we find an atmosphere of prayer and fasting prayer and fasting you talk about what's going on at Chapel of Change you talk about what's going on at Center Point I guarantee you both of those churches pray and fast more than most churches that are more than almost all churches I know about there's an intercessory spirit there that gives the atmosphere that these things of God are happening in. we ignore that or we presume that but we can't we have to prioritize it the other night not long ago the pastors uh, and me we locked ourselves in the church for 24 hours and people came and go went for 24 hours we just fasted and prayed in the church for 24 hours and I can tell you story after story that really just came out of that prayer time and then we all need one another the role of denominations and networks are so important denominations can empower or they can disempower they can really help or they can really hinder and I appreciate so much the leadership of our bishop so let me close with this The New Testament church, um, they didn't have boards or buildings, seminaries, budgets, 
bands. Um, and all those things are good. All those things can be used to serve the church and to serve multiplication. But I'm just telling you, they didn't have those. And yet, because they had a multiplication mindset that empowered ordinary believers and believed that those believers had a fire on their head, and those believers went out and made disciples who made disciples, the book of Acts tells us those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Our world is messed up, and it's looking for those that will turn it right side up for the kingdom of God. That can be us.